Well, this album's probably one of the most poetic and certainly musically one of the most beautiful you've done. Are you pleased with it? I'm very pleased. I feel that it really perfects everything that's been slightly attempted in the past. And I feel it's the absolutely most whole Smith record. There's an interesting thing about it is there's an awful lot lyrically in it mm. that's about loving and loving and losing, mm. which you haven't really touched on before. Mm. Was, why is that? Did something in your life changed? Well, it, it really hasn't, to be quite honest. No, I really still feel, and I, I will admit that I, the themes are still more or less within me the same. They haven't really changed. Nothing uh, incredible has happened at all. So, but once again, as musically, I think it perfects everything that's been touched upon. I think lyrically, I've got a lot better, really. If it's musically perfect, does that worry you then about what you go on to next? No, it, I don't worry about it, but I, I can recognise the fact that within the future, there has to be some slight, um, um, something new, I think. There has to be a slight change, but nothing, nothing dramatic, nothing drastic. How does Donny Marr feel about it? Does he feel the same as you do, that yeah. he's reached the zenith? Well, yes. I mean, it can almost sound like a exhausting you know, one's dimensions or the capabilities of a particular uh, viewpoint, um, which can sound quite negative. But it isn't. It's a positive thing, I think. You know, we've made quite a lot of records. That's what really it uh, says to me. So one of the interesting tracks, Paint a Vulgar Picture, is the mm. most sort of damning view of the music business I've mm. ever heard. Yeah. Now you obviously have to operate within that music business, so mm. how do you, you cope with the two ideals? It's very hard because it's very hard because if you have very strong opinions about the music industry, as most performers do not, it's very, very difficult, especially when with interviews one gets the chance to air these opinions. And I think that really if you have views which are considered um, quite strong, they're instantly considered quite negative. Because I think the music industry gets very, very, uh, it's very impatient with people who have views, <laughs> viewpoints, because it's uh, all a very nice organized uh, pattern and it's a nice little bubble and it works really well and it employs lots of people. So therefore, if, if, you, if you become to suggest change, well, I think you're quite quickly swept away. Not many people have ever tried it, I might add, as you know. <laughs> But if, if, you, if the suggestion of um, um, change is there. Do you, I mean, do you think it's possible to change the nature of the music business? I mean, it doesn't seem to be. I think it's possible to change in small ways, and it takes a very long time. But overall, in the most important and most effective ways, I don't think it is at all. I think the, con the people who control the music industry are, are very strong. In a way, and also, an important point yeah. is that groups very rarely tend to band together. It's a very, uh, artists are very isolated and there's no real strong, um, for instance, I find it very hard to believe in a movement of groups, for instance, or a movement of artists. Is that everybody's, because they're in competition with each other? Yes, and everybody's scrambling and everybody wants, um, seems to want to be liked. Don't you want to be liked? Yes, I do, but not really at any price. Not at any price. Is it important then that you're liked just by the people who buy your records or, or by everybody? I mean, is there a secret mm, Morrissey in there? I, to think, be I think it's important, as with everybody, I presume, in daily life, to be liked for the right reasons, I expect. Because another of your tracks, you know, Last Night I Dreamt That Somebody Loved Me, I mean, that's mm. a very moving little mm. song, a very sort of heart rending one. Is that yes. you? I mean, are you writing for the song? It's so well? me, yes, it is me. And uh, sometimes I, um, well, most of the time I, I feel that although the Smiths are quite enormously popular, those records will never be played, those songs will never be heard. It's, it, it, and I realised that I think when Meet His Murder um, entered the chart at number one, and the title track was never ever played anywhere, I thought that was quite peculiar. And also The Queen Is Dead entered at number two. And I never heard any of those songs ever on the radio, whether it be nighttime or daytime. Well, I played it, I played it. Yes, actually, Muriel, I heard it when you played it. And you said lots of very nice things about it. I was actually in on that night. Mm. Well, being loved is a funny thing, especially if you're in the music business, though, because to get back to the, the point of changing things in the music business, mm. a lot of bands and 
previously have always tried to go for social reform and radical mm. change, but in a way they've been caught up in, their own, in, in the system themselves. Yeah. Do you feel that by criticising things, in a way you're falling into the same trap, you can criticise the music business, but you're part of it. Mm. Do you feel that that's a difficult thing to get over? Well, people find it hard to believe that I really don't feel part of it, but I really, really don't. I don't really feel part of the big um, whirlpool of the music industry. I don't feel that at all. I never have. And I think perhaps in order to feel a part of it, you really have to go through the usual ri the party ritual and um, such things. Being part of that whole big nonsensical pop. Ligging, <laughs> doing yes, and bopping. ligging and bopping and being seen and patting other people on the back unnecessarily. I could never do that. There have been so many opportunities over the last few years for the Smiths to make their life so much easier. Like what? Just really by simply being totally agreeable with everybody. And are you disagreeable? Yes. In what way? I find it very hard just to just simply slide into the typical role of uh, being a successful pop star. I mean, even for me to say those words is quite unusual. It's quite awkward for me to say them. And it, uh, for the first time quite recently, we went to Italy and we were doing several TV, television shows with lots of famous people like Espano Ballet, Curiosity Killer Cat, and a lot of famous people. And we were all together for four days. And it was the first time I'd ever been in that situation before, because I've not really met many um, performers, stars, or whatever. And I found it very intriguing, because I, I found them all quite nice. But it was really very evident to me that the, there is this very, very strong um, network. And there's this very strong mode of behavior. And I realized even more so on inspecting that, just how far away I was from it. Did they recognize it? I think they did, but they were very nice to me. Very, very nice to me. I don't know why. <laughs> no reason they shouldn't be. Fools, really. <laughs> but somebody said, in fact, I think Alexis Sale said that he's noticed that celebrities who consider themselves equal status tend to hang about together. For instance, you wouldn't get uh, curiosity killed the cat hanging around with the stones, but you'd get the stones and Bowie mm. hanging around together. Yeah. So, mm. are there no contemporaries of you that sort of attempt to get your friendship because of that? Yes, there are one or two people, but I don't think it's really, uh, perhaps simply because we are of the same generation, musical generation. Yes, there are, I can't deny there are one or two people, such as um, Pete Burns, Lloyd Cole. So, uh, yes, I can't really deny that at all. <laughs> But talking about the album lyrically again, another mm. thing that's, that's unusual is you, you've been writing about girls in it more. Mm. You don't normally write about girls. Mm. Why have you suddenly noticed them? <laughs> I haven't really just suddenly noticed them. <laughs> I'm short-sighted, but no, it's really because initially I suffered this great delusion that um, by writing words which were um, theoretically genderless at any rate, that I was actually therefore speaking for everybody. But a lot of people were pointing out to me, well, this isn't really happening at all. You're completely deluding yourself. You know, women don't exist in your world at all, which wasn't true. So um, I think I felt over the last 12 months a need to be a little bit more demonstrative where you know, fighting gender was concerned. So you're doing it in a tokenist way then, as mentioned the girlies. No, you're really at <laughs> the point. I've always done it. But I feel, I feel that it has to be a little bit more slightly simplified. And you have to actually use the word her instead of... <laughs> and imply it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you you make no secret about the fact that you're celibate. So are all these lyrics imaginary then? Are they imaginary loss? Not really. I mean, I don't think I've really mentioned um, sex anywhere. So, uh, but it's still implied very much. Mm, I mean, the, well, the, the implication, <laughs> really. <laughs> well, yes, there's an implication. So it's spiritual love you're talking about then? Mm, quite largely, yes. In fact, completely, yes. Completely spiritual love. And is it imaginary or is it true? Oh, it's true, yes. Yes, it is true. I mean, I do, I do know people. <laughs> <laughs> but do, do you have a rough time, even, you know, in the spiritual sense of loving people? I mean, are you... Have you had a life that's full of disappointment. Yes, I've had a dreadful life. <laughs> it's been awful from start to finish. <laughs> um, 
Well, in some in some ways, yes, I think it has. It might have been slightly over documented in the past, I think, but it's there nonetheless. But I do see people, and I know people, and uh, but I can't deny that I do generally find relationships quite um, blunderously awful. Is that your fault? Or? Yes. Is it because you choose the wrong person, or that you're not capable of holding down a relationship? <laughs> no, it doesn't be real. <laughs> <laughs> that might be your problem. <laughs> no, it isn't. It isn't that at all. It's um, something else. <laughs> no, really, it's. Um, I don't think I, I. In fact, I absolutely have never really had a a fulfilling relationship, which is not something that I, I intend to state as some great dramatic revelation. But it's true, nonetheless. I haven't really, which has gave me a particular particular viewpoint on relationships, which I, which I suppose isn't really very common. And yet, it doesn't seem to have made you bitter. Oh, it has. Has it? <laughs> yes. When you're well known for being critical, do you find that it wounds you very deeply when people do the same to you? Can you take criticism? Sometimes criticism is quite useful. And just because it's negative really it doesn't mean that it's it's wrong and people have warped viewpoints so some, sometimes i quite welcome it because sometimes i sit back and say well yes that's that's absolutely true i am really a very silly person <laughs> so no sometimes i welcome it but sometimes when i know it's just somebody who dislikes me for completely unknown reasons i don't really accept it i tend to stamp about and you know, phone up the lawyers and things like that, and smash milk bottles. Well, are you, I do have a compassionate imagination then. When you speak out about someone perhaps you haven't met, like, I don't know if you did, when you spoke out about, about Bob Geldof, did you worry that he would phone lawyers and stamp about and break milk bottles? Do you think you'd hurt him? Uh, I, 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 I didn't think so at the time, because I thought that he was far too busy in this great big world of, you know, live aid that he wouldn't really pay any attention to my viewpoints, which were repeated so so often throughout quite a long period that suddenly it seemed like I was starting some kind of a movement, uh, which wasn't really the case. And I later heard that he even um, a few months ago, he was approaching a mutual friend and quite distressed and saying, why does Marcy have this viewpoint and so on. Which um, I don't think at the time I really meant the whole thing to become like the rock upon which I stand. But it tended to. And it became a, a recurring theme in, in so many interviews I did. I didn't really care that much about the whole event <laughs> to really uh, prolong it, prolong the viewpoints. Even people like royalty can be hurt personally, or do you think they're miles above that or perhaps too stupid? I think it's a, a mixture of all of those things, most definitely. I think they're too far gone to really pay any attention. Uh, when you consider the world they're born into, I don't even think they're aware of very light criticism, not really. I suppose when it's about uh, a person's personal facial features, perhaps, <laughs> it can be quite stingy, really. But generally, I think... Uh, no, I don't think that. It's not the world they live in. I don't believe that. Would it, how would it hurt you if the Smiths, let's say, hypothetically, that your album wasn't as big a success as you wanted it to be, especially when you, you, you think it's reached a particular height? Mm -hmm. Would that devastate you, or would you still be aware of the fact that you, would, you were doing something that was correct? Well, it would devastate me, but I would really feel that it was a miscalculation on other people's part, I, because I'm, I, I'm severely critical of what the Smiths do. I'm more critical than practically anybody. It's not really as if I just bang this constant drum of total uh, musical self-assurance and simply imply that this is the right road and every other road is the road to hell. I'm not like that at all. I'm genuinely the first person to say, well, it's not really very good, despite what we're saying, because it's so easy for groups, once they become successful, to actually get carried on and get carried away rather than get fooled by the, you know, their own mystique even really. They suddenly believe that everything they do and everything they touch is right anyway because it's us. 
But I've never felt that. I've always been standing back and looking at looking at it from a, a different, um, a very objective angle. But I think I would be quite upset if the public said no, no more. How, how important is money to you and how important has it been to you in the past? Well, it's, it was very important to me in the past because I really had absolutely none, ever. And I was really very, very indescribably poor for years and years and years. So a very basic amount of money was critically important to me. But now that I have, shall we say, access to a lot of money, um, I'm not very materialistic. I don't own great gulps of land and I don't own great bulks of machinery and things like that. I don't own anything, in fact, apart from a house. <laughs> but I'm not materialistic in the least. I think I'm, as long as I'm quite comfortable and I don't starve to death and I can afford to put the heating on and things like that, I have very pathetically humble requirements. <laughs> I mean, most people feel that if you have release a single and it gets to number 29, that you instantly have un, 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 uncountable amounts of money. But of course, it's not true. We've never earned money from singles. We've earned money from albums. But it still isn't fantastically unbe unbelievable amount. If the Smiths ended today, in a couple of years, I'd have to really start you know, trying to find my old uh, CSE results and things like that. What did you get? Well, I got an O-level in woodwork, which I'm sure one day I'll put to great use. You and Princess Diana. <laughs> well, I knew we had something in common. But what oh. things frighten you? Not really. Uh, what's it's frightening you me. You desire travel. No, I don't desire travel, which makes things quite difficult because obviously with most successful groups travel a lot, constantly every day, they do world tours, things like that. The Smiths have never really, for instance, uh, played in Europe. We've only been to certain countries once or twice to do one or two dates, <laughs> but generally we haven't really touched anywhere except America. So are you not curious about other cultures and countries that you'd like to, to go and have a look? Yes, I am. But within the framework of actually being in a, a group, you don't really actually savour any, any of the countries anyway. You, you're just really in this tunnel of movement from one point to the next point, to a coach, to a bus, to a plane or whatever. And you can't really absorb cultures anyway. And alarmingly, you don't really meet people. Well then, personally, wouldn't you rather just take a, a few months off and, and go somewhere? And mm. Where would you go? Where would I go? <laughs> These are the really hard questions. Where would you go on your holidays? <laughs> uh, it's, I'm, I, I don't really have any mad, insane desire to really see many countries. Not really. Is that because you are such an insular person? I think? think it is, yes. I hate flying. And I don't really like traveling that much. And I'm very insular. So that really puts the markers on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Can you have a view of the world then without moving about? Yes, but it's quite a closed view. <laughs> no, we certainly have to scrap that. <laughs> what, what kind of perspective does one have in the world when you're not curious? I mean, are you curious about the world even though you don't want to physically go there? Do you have a, a curiosity what it's like to be an Amazonian Indian? Or someone living in Tibet, or don't you really care very much? Well, I don't, I'm not really that curious, really. I'm not really that curious about um, being an Amazonian Indian at all. <laughs> <laughs> but that's me for you, really. <laughs> it's come to the do, point do where I think horrible? people who really care about the environment are now absolutely political. People who really care about animals. It's like the, to. To be a vegetarian is practically the strongest political statement that you can make these days. And that's very interesting because it, it, it shows, I think, the way things are moving. And suddenly all that talk about you know, domination and uh, power and so on is just doesn't really feel or impress anybody. Do you, do you read a lot of books? Yes, I do. I read a lot of books. What kind of thing? Uh, quite, quite varied, really. Um, I have a lot of things which I've had since I was much younger, which I still have and which I reread. And like what, for instance, what's a, a one that you reread? I have a lot of plays. I quite like plays, and I have a lot of feminist books and um, 
masculinist books even. And uh, I find those things quite interesting. And it was something that once upon a time I might feel obliged to really dump on everybody. But I don't now. I really don't. For some, for some reason it's all just passed. Not because I don't believe it, but just because I think people find it actually very boring to hear. Can, can you write or act? I don't think I can act at all. I don't you think write, I can act so at all. Could, you, could you write something that wasn't uh, accompanying That's music? Could you write a novel? Yes, yes, I could. Do you plan to? Yes, I do plan to. Are you working on it just now? Yes. Really? I'm working on the cover. <laughs> no, yes, I am actually. How far ahead is it going to take you to finish it? A long, long time, a long, long time. But I don't. I never really felt. I, I never really wanted to be the type of person who does everything instantly and is seen everywhere doing lots of different, fascinating things. I think once the Smiths have ended, it will be time to think about such things, but I don't think I'd really attempt them while the Smiths were in their full, full uh, flow, not really, because it's very important to me to concentrate on exactly what I'm doing now and give it the fullest concentration I can think of. That's why such things as video, really, um, has never been a top priority, because I don't, th don't think I could really think about plotting videos and things like that. Yes, now you, you, you just don't like doing for the Smiths and obviously that must upset the record companies mm, very much. Yes. How, how hard was it to, to make them see your point of view? And It's very hard and people still don't really see it. You know, after five years of constantly saying, but this is how I really feel, people don't accept it at all. And um, Why is it that you feel that you, you, you can't make videos? You won't I don't make like the way people look in videos. <laughs> it's really that simple. I always watch videos of groups and I think, oh, it's, you know, they look awful. That's a shame. Why did they do that? I never see videos of groups and say, well, that's really useful. That's really flattering. Because it's always, and it's, it's a sphere where people who can't act are simply pretending that they can. And people who don't have any extraordinary talents are just really implying that they do. And they don't. I mean, simply because people make records, it doesn't mean that they have unlimited talents and resources in every possible artistic area that anybody can think of. But there is this modern assumption that pop stars or whatever have just elastic talent. It just goes on forever and it can be tugged into all areas. I don't believe that. And don't, I, you, don't you feel you have any talent then that would come out in video? Not really. I mean, as I say, I don't believe I can act. And I think specifically that's what it, what it is, really. I don't think I could really convince anybody at all. It's quite easy, I suppose, to walk through the woods and to wrap a cloak around you and jump on the back of a camel, you know, things like that. <laughs> but I don't really want to stretch public credulity that much. <laughs> Do you like the medium of film? Do you like feature films? Yes, I'm quite obsessed with feature films. I have a huge collection that I just watch and re-watch and things like that. And so has that never tempted you to try and be part of them and be in them? Not to be in them. Screenplays interest me very much. Dialogue interests me a great deal. But I've never been terribly interested in photography and things like that and cameras and you know, chemists. <laughs> <laughs> well, in paint a, a vulgar picture, talking also about the thrill of being a young fan, one of the the boys from the ugly new houses, mm -hmm. getting a chance to touch mm -hmm. a star. Now mm -hmm. you're in that position of being the star. How mm -hmm. do you think it feels for fans to be able to get close mm -hmm. to you? Well, I, I can understand it completely because I went through the entire experience of, of um, really, well, in, certainly in my case, I did worship the people that I liked, the people, the people like T-Rex and David Bowie and Roxy Music. And I went to a lot of concerts in the early 70s, 72, 73. And I would arrive really early at noon and I would be at the stage door and I'd wait for the coach to arrive and just really to glimpse people stepping from the coach into the, into the venue was something that was imprinted upon me and would never leave me. So it was very a great thrill to see people close up. Is it strange then to be the one stepping from the coach into the venue, or is it not because you understand what they're it's doing? It's not strange at all. It isn't strange at all. I can really understand it. I can. Have you met any of your heroes now that you're in the, in the same league, in a way? Uh, yes, I have. I have met a few. But it's not really something now that I staunchly advise. I think it's quite, quite nice in a way to keep 
the memory sealed, if you like, or, or the vision at least of how you see people and how you see the records they make. And also, as I get to hear anecdotes about certain records that I loved, how they were made and how awful it was and how such a person couldn't really play and they got somebody else to sing and so on, I like to cherish the memory. I like to keep it quite closed. Do you think people, your fans, would be disappointed if they met you? Well, I think it's hard to gauge, but I think there is a degree of disappointment because to certain people who take... Um, music so seriously and think a great deal about um, the artists they like and they have an absolute concrete vision of what this person is and of what this person stands for and sometimes you meet people and you realize that it isn't really altogether true and you've really formed your own picture that's quite personal and it's quite useful to you but not really necessarily in line with the reality so sometimes I, and also with me I find that People expect it to be a certain way, and if it really isn't the way that I am, I can't really just go along with it and please them. I find I really have to interrupt and say, well, no, I, I don't think that at all. I'm not that way. I'm not like that or whatever. So it's quite hard to juggle with that. Well, what kind of people are hardcore Smith fans now then in 87? It's, it's quite hard to assess because initially we had an audience that was totally identifiable in 1983, certainly. It was a specific breed, but now it really seems to have spread a little. What, there is a, what was the specific breed? I think it was a specific breed of, of very deep people, people who um, perhaps liked, well, quite feverishly liked pop music really hated the chart and really hated the press and really hated the notion of listening to the radio and they they just disapproved but they they in the same sense they wanted it to to mean something to them they really wanted it in their lives so i think they were quite a um, initially they were quite deep thinking people people were quite high principled people also if the audience changed radically for instance, if you started attracting screaming young girls who weren't listening to what you were playing, <laughs> would you stop doing it? Would it upset you so much? Yes, but I don't think that would happen at all, <laughs> which is obviously the easy way out of that one. But I, when I see certain groups who have that audience who just persistently scream and doesn't matter what the song is, let's just scream, and I find that really exhausting. It's a different world completely. Like I went to see Aha in America. <laughs> And I really liked, I really liked their records. But when I saw them, and it was just really this constant, deafening squeal, not even a respectable scream, it was actually an, an indecent squeal, and which completely drowned out the musicians and threw them off their tracks because they seemed totally embarrassed by all these, you know, screaming girls. I thought, well, no, I wouldn't really like that. Well, what kind of <clears throat> what kind of lifespan do you think the Smiths have just now? How long do you think it can go on? It's hard to say. I can't answer that question at all. I just don't know. Do you still feel very much that you have roots in Manchester? Yes, I do feel that I have very strong roots in Manchester. And even though I'm not there every day, it, it's just something that I really can't get away from. How do you cope with living somewhere like London, which is much harder city to live in, I would imagine, than Manchester? Well, it's, I find it easy because I live in a nice place. I couldn't imagine living here if I didn't live in a, in a nice place. I find it completely unbearable. And also, it's a, it's a horrible place to live unless you can survive uh, financially. It, I, I would imagine it would be awful. I remember coming to London when I was uh, 17. I moved to London, as you know, practically everybody did. And I, last, I lasted, I think it was seven days or eight days, but I brought everything that I possessed, these huge cases, and it was a really awful experience. So I can imagine London from that viewpoint is quite treacherous. But for me, I simply survived by really avoiding the music industry and avoiding that um, kerfuffle of activity and just being quite private. So how often do you go back to Manchester? I go back to Manchester perhaps once a month for a weekend. And does that recharge your batteries or do you get something different from Manchester than you do from London? 
I don't go out in Manchester either, so I don't really, I don't really sense the benefits, if you like, if they be benefits of, of um, both places in that way. So being in Manchester, I'm just, I just really go from one house to another, which are very mundane, but there it is nonetheless. Well, if you don't go out to, to clubs and so on, when you leave the house, where is it you want to go? What do you do for leisure pursuits outside your four walls? I don't have any. The only time I ever leave the house is to buy food. What goes on in your house then? <laughs> <laughs> what goes on in my house? Very, very little. I mean, it's just <laughs> I want to die. Very, very little. There's only generally, only generally me in there. <laughs> and what do you do? <laughs> I'm beginning to sound like a dirty old man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I make lots of telephone calls <laughs> to agencies in Soho. No. <laughs> right. 